speeding up the design workflow. This is something that you have asked me a lot about. Maybe you're working at a startup and the environment is really intense and there's a lot of projects going on at once, or maybe you have a really tight deadline on a project. Either way, I think there's a few different techniques and things you can do to make your workflow go a little bit faster. Let's talk about it in this video. All right, this may be controversial, but my point of view on this is that if you approach this by trying to design faster, you're not gonna get anywhere. Trying to do the same amount of work, but in a shorter amount of time and trying to design quicker is just gonna stress you out. You might end up doing a lot of late nights or pulling in some weekends, and we obviously wanna try and avoid that. Ultimately, I don't think we can really rush the creative process. You might end up producing work quicker, but I think you're really gonna compromise on quality if you try to like physically and literally design faster. And by the way, I've done a whole podcast episode on this exact topic with my co-host Charlie Marie so you can go and listen to that for a more of a like detailed in-depth discussion about this topic. So what is the answer then? If we can't literally design faster and produce quality results then what is it that we can do to make our design process and workflow a bit quicker? Well in my opinion I think the best thing that you can do is either remove or optimize existing steps in your current design process. I've got a few ideas and tangible recommendations that I want to give you so let's jump on into those. Number one you could skip foundational research. I know, I know research is so important, but it's also very, very time consuming if you want to go and run your own end to end foundational design research. Usually this requires you to go really deep into the problem space, likely running one on one interviews with different users, consolidating results, running surveys and drawing up insights and creating all of these research reports to deliver the results back to the team. While valuable, this can be very, very time consuming. So instead of doing that original research, could you do some of your own desk research or competitor analysis. Have a Google, have a look online, see what resources are out there. There's a chance that you're not the first person to sort of do research into this area or problem space. So do a bit of a search online and see what research already exists for this problem area. Next, you could look internally at research that might've already been done. Now, this is more likely if you work at a larger scale company where they've been doing research for a long time, they have a research repository full of insights from past research. Go and have a look and see if someone has already researched this area or if there is existing research that's been done that could help inform some of your design decisions. If you really do need to get some fresh insights, and I get it, sometimes we do need that, then could you consider doing a cognitive walkthrough internally? I'm not gonna go into detail in this video about cognitive walkthroughs, but essentially you create some concepts and you get some people internally together that have nothing to do with the project or aren't even on your team. And you kind of show them these different concepts and get their ideas and feedback. It's quick, it's internal, you don't need to do all of the sort of recruiting to find different users, and you can kind of skip the sort of one-on-one -on -one interviews and do these in more of a group setting. The second thing you could do is embrace existing design resources and templates. These are great for like jump-starting or kick-starting a certain part in your design process. Instead of having to create resources and templates from scratch, you could use something that's already existing that saves you so much time building that out on your own. There is one specific website that has a range of templates and UI kits for you to use that I want to specifically shout out in this video. I'm really grateful that they were a sponsor for this and that is SAS Design. SAS Design has a range of Figma templates and UI kits that's really going to help you speed up your workflow. You don't need to create each and every UI element from scratch. You can grab a template or kit from SAS Design and use them as your foundation or starting point. The files are set up in Figma in a way that you can fully customize it really easily to fit your brand or company or project needs. There are master components, there are styles, there's even auto layout. All you need to do is jump in there and it has everything set up exactly the way you need and want it to, where you can just make a change in one place and see those changes reflected all throughout. What's cool about SAS Design is that you can use it for commercial use, which is awesome. You also get a fully editable Figma file, so it's none of this view only stuff. You can go in and edit it directly how you need to. I went through and downloaded some of their templates and there are so many different kinds of templates. Whether you need something for wireframing, UI kits, maybe you even need something that's for like material design or iOS design. SAS Design has it all. What's also great is that you can preview these files for free and then purchase it when you're ready. If you want to check out SAS Design, check the link in the description below. 
All right, let's move on to number three, which is setting constraints. Often I don't like to set too many constraints at the beginning of a project because I don't like how that kind of hinders your ideation and your brainstorming for different solutions on how to kind of solve the problem. However, in cases where you might be time constrained or there's a lot of pressure to produce work really quickly, constraints can be a great way to kind of intentionally limit that sort of more blue sky thinking and stay really focused on the problem at hand. Constraints can help you keep the problem scope narrow and encourage you to really zoom in to a particular problem area or space. I think there's a few different kinds of constraints you could set. One could be a time constraint. Maybe you want to limit yourself to two weeks and say, what, what is it that I can design and what is it that we can achieve in two weeks? Another constraint could be technical. Maybe you set a technical constraint to only use existing tech that you already have built in the back end rather than having to create and build new tech. And lastly, you might set a feature constraint. For example, if you're working on a booking software, maybe you set a feature constraint that someone can book a call, but for now, maybe we won't allow them to cancel their booking and instead they have to contact support. I know, not a great user experience, but hey, it's a feature constraint that lets you get the product out the door faster. And my last recommendation, recommendation number four, is to break the project up into smaller milestones. Oftentimes when approaching a project, you quickly realize there is so much we could do. There is so much potential and there is so much to be done. And I think if you approach this by breaking up all of those product requirements and those priorities and those feature requests into individual sort of bucketed milestones, and you can sort of release those sequentially, that's going to help you get a project or product to market faster. When you break up the project into smaller milestones or phases, this is actually kind of beneficial for design because it means that design can always be one step ahead of engineering and you're kind of sequentially going through those milestones. So as design is working on milestone two, engineering is building out milestone one and so on. This means you can do smaller, more iterative releases and launches of the product. And also that means that you can sort of learn things along the way. As you put something out to market, you're gonna get some insights and some learnings from that. And you can use that to iterate and improve on the next milestone. Okay friend, those are kind of my recommendations for how to kind of speed up your workflow and work faster as a designer. As I said at the beginning, I don't think the right approach to this is physically designing faster and quicker in Figma, like moving your mouse faster, trying to design concepts faster. It's just going to stress you out. I think it's more about making these kind of high level, more product level decisions of what can we do in this process? Uh, what can we cut out? How can we reprioritize? What can we use or reuse that's already existing, that's been done before? I think that's a much more strategic way to approach this problem. I'm really curious to hear what you think. Let me know if you disagree with me or you think I'm totally off track. Maybe it is possible to design physically faster. I haven't had success with it, but if you have, I would love to hear more about it. Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you in a future video. Peace, bye.